If I were to list the new vehicles in North America that I was most excited about over the past year to 18 months, Ford would have three top positions. The Ford Mustang Mach-E, the F-150 Lightning, and the all-new Ford Maverick that I'm standing right next to. This is Ford's smallest pickup truck in America, but it's not quite as small as you might think. Let's talk about the Maverick's dimensions first, because I've seen a lot of confused reporting on this subject. Some folks have called this America's first truly compact pickup truck. And that's not quite the case. Now, this is definitely narrow for the North American pickup truck market. At 72.6 inches wide, this is slightly narrower than a Bronco Sport or a Ford Escape, and a full six inches narrower than a Ford Explorer. You can tell up front that this receives some inspiration from the rest of the Ford pickup lineup, but also a little bit of inspiration from that Bronco Sport, and I definitely think this is a handsome truck look. This definitely is more truck-like than the new Hyundai Santa Cruz, which is actually a little bit shorter than this in terms of overall vehicle length. This is a first edition, and as you can see, the front grille doesn't change too much, but this has radar adaptive cruise control, and there's a cute little Easter egg here. It actually has a little pickup truck icon and ACC right there to basically tell you what that little blanked out section of the front bumper is for. Be sure to let me know what you think about the design of the Maverick down there in the comment section. I think this is a really good looking small truck. Now about that small part, if you think a Ford Explorer is a compact vehicle, then in general terms, this is a compact vehicle as well, because this is actually one inch longer than a three row Ford Explorer at 199.7 inches long. This is considerably longer than Ford Rangers when they first launched in America back in 1983. That model was 24 inches smaller than this. According to Ford, the big reason that this is the size that it is is because they're trying to give you compact crossover like interior room with a usable bed behind. And that means that we have four doors. And those original Rangers, of course, were mainly two-door pickup trucks. But now, two-door trucks don't really sell in the United States. And this is going after a different customer than that original Ranger was. This is going after someone that would ordinarily be shopping for something like a Ford Escape, but they want the practicality of an open bed in the rear. If you live in an urban area, the Maverick is certainly going to be easier to park because of its narrower dimensions. But keep in mind that the length of the vehicle is just about as long as an Explorer, so the turning diameter is just about as big as well, 40 feet for all versions. The rear end style is definitely modern pickup truck. We have halogen tail lamps, but upon closer inspection, you'll notice a few things. Because of the width of the vehicle, the tailgate is quite a bit smaller than something like a Ford Ranger. You can fit four by wide things in the bed of the truck, but it won't fit between the wheel wells. It'll have to be just above the wheel wells. Aside from the Maverick's low starting price of just under $21,500 after destination, the other surprising thing about this vehicle is that the hybrid system is the standard drivetrain, not the optional one. This hybrid system is essentially borrowed out of the Ford Escape. The engine itself is a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated four-cylinder producing 162 horsepower, and when combined with the dual electric motors over there on the other side, this system gives you 191 horsepower. But the magic number here is the 37 miles per gallon combined and 40 miles per gallon in the city. Some reviewers describe Ford's hybrid system as a CVT hybrid system. That is not correct. This transmission is not a CVT at all, and it's not really a transmission in the truest sense of the word either, I guess. It has a planetary gear set and two electric motors over there on that side, and those three things together act like a transmission. It can drive the vehicle in electric-only mode at highway speeds, and it can also help move power mechanically from the engine to the front wheels, but the electric motors are always involved in locomotion. They can never be completely removed from the equation, and this absolutely does not have a belt and pulley style CVT. And that's why this hybrid system is so reliable. There's a lot less to go wrong. If you want the Maverick to go backwards, it simply spins the motor backwards. There's no need for a reverse gear. Now, if you want a little bit more oomph, there's an optional engine. That's a two liter four cylinder turbo, also borrowed out of the Ford Escape, that produces 250 horsepower, 277 pound feet of torque, and it's mated to a standard eight speed automatic transmission. If you opt for front wheel drive, you'll get 26 miles per gallon combined. If you opt for all wheel drive, you'll get 25 miles per gallon combined, so significantly less than the hybrid model. Why no all wheel drive hybrid? Honestly, Ford has not given a direct answer about that, but I suspect one could happen in the future if there's enough demand, because Ford obviously mates this hybrid system with a mechanical all-wheel drive system in some of their vehicles. Obviously, pricing and practicality are two big reasons to buy the Maverick. This is going to be one of the least expensive Fords in America, it's the least expensive hybrid in America, and it's going to be one of the most practical hybrids thanks to this bed back here. Now let's talk about the bed. The length of the bed from over here, the opening right back there to the cab is 54.4 inches. 
The bed's lift-in height is 30.1 inches. That's definitely a solid reason to buy this over a body-on-frame truck if you want a lower load-in height. The payload capacity is 1,500 pounds rated in all models, but obviously that will get reduced based on the options that you select. The model that I'm driving is pretty close to that at 1,450 pounds. There's been a lot of debate about this versus the Santa Cruz when it comes to payload. Generally speaking, the Santa Cruz is going to give you a higher payload capacity. Initially, there was some reporting that only 600 or 650 pounds could go in the bed of the Santa Cruz. It turns out that's not correct. Hyundai said that that is when you have a trailer connected or you have the cab loaded with five people. Remember that payload includes the driver and all passengers. So yes, theoretically, you could put 1,500 pounds in the bed here, but then you wouldn't be able to drive it anywhere. Between the wheel wells, the cargo bed is 42.6 inches wide. So no four by goods between the wheel wells, but the wheel wells are pretty low. Again, thanks to the unibody construction of the truck. So that means that you could put four by eight sheets of things in here. They'd be right about there in the vehicle. And in order to enable that, we have little tethers here for the tailgate standard that allow the tailgate to pop up into this position. That is basically the same height as the wheel wells over there. So you could put a two by six across the wheel wells to help keep things a bit more rigid up front and then hang those four by sheet goods right there out the rear. To make carrying that load a little bit more safe, Ford has given us tie down points on either side of the tailgate. These also function as bottle openers. And in case you're wondering, yes, you can still close the tailgate when those tethers are latched over there to the top post. You can also wrap the cable right there around the mid post to have this tailgate up even higher. Ford gives us a number of other cargo practical touches like D-ring tie downs right there up front. There are going to be some available cargo rails on the side of the cargo bed, tie downs over here. We also have storage cubbies on either side of the base model trucks. If you get some of the upper end trucks, then we have a 400 watt inverter outlet right there. 12 volt DC power is available in two places in the cargo bed. That's a really handy touch. It's over there on that side and then over here on this side. Ford's also leaning hard into the DIY landscape with these QR codes in the back. If you scan the QR code, you can get some additional dimensions and instructions for making your own accessories and slotting them right back here in the cargo bed. And in case you're wondering, yes, we still have a spare tire right there under the cargo bed. Due to the low starting price of the Maverick, we don't have as many standard driver assistance features as you'd find, say, in a Ford Edge. Auto high beams are standard, as is autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection, but features like adaptive cruise control, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic detection, lane keeping assistance, lane departure warning, and evasive steering assist are optional, but you will find them on the top end trims. From some angles, the really upright proportions that we see in the Maverick can make it look cartoonish, but I actually think cartoonish in kind of a cute way really lead to good room on the inside. I have about three or four inches of headroom. So even though the Maverick is a small truck for America, if you're a six foot four or six foot five, you really shouldn't have any problem sitting up front. This seat has a two-way lumbar support. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion. And if I move this seat all the way back and all the way down, I have about four inches of headroom. Now, one thing you should know if you are taller or shorter than I am is that the seat bottom cushion does not separately adjust for tilt. It simply goes up and down and tilts as it goes up and down. Jumping into the back, we have pretty similar legroom to the Ford Escape. Again, the mission of this vehicle is to give you compact crossover like interior space with the added bed in the rear. So with this front seat adjuster for me at six feet tall, I have about three inches of legroom left. If you were a little bit shorter than me, you could probably put a rear facing child seat back here with no problem. If the front seat is all the way back in its tracks, however, you can see that things are a little bit more compact. My knees are actually just resting inside the little dished out section of the front seat. The rear seat back folds slightly forward because this is where Ford stores the jack. There's also the filler funnel if you need to fill the gas tank from a fuel can and the top tether anchor for child seats. You would top tether anchor, then put the seats back into place and then continue installing the child seat. There's a padded center armrest in this model with two cup holders. And then over here in the center console, we don't find any air vents, but we do find some charge only USB ports. And that little latch right there is where you can dock additional accessories. You can also get drawings from Ford and 3D print your own accessories if you're interested in that. There's also a storage area under the rear seats that has that same sort of dock connector that we see on the back of the center console. Again, a QR code so that we can link to instructions on how to use it. Over here behind the passenger seat, this is where we find the 12 volt battery in the hybrid model. The rear seats are a little bit different. If you get the hybrid model, you lose one inch of legroom and a little bit of cargo area there where the 12 volt battery is. And that's really the only interior compromise because the hybrid battery pack is located underneath the vehicle. It is liquid cooled rather than air cooled. As a result of the battery location, ground clearance goes from 8.6 inches down to 8.3 inches. 
The model that I spent most of my time in today does not have a moonroof, but one is available if you so desire. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, two-way adjustable headrests. As you can see, we have a lot of headroom back there for the rear passengers as well. The ceiling has sort of a ridge right here in the middle, so if you do have your front seats reclined really far or move back really far, then you get a little bit less headroom. Since I'm in a Lariat trim, we get an upgrade from the base model's cloth upholstery. This is really a three-tone interior. We have charcoal on the outside of the seats, brown on the middle of the seats, and then moving over to the doors, we have a light gray color. Just about all the plastics that you see in here are hard, but I think Ford has done a really great job in here dressing things up, just as we see in the Bronco Sport. We have some copper accents on the doors. These things change depending on the trim that you get. Also geometric patterns right here for this hard center insert that's gray. A lot of texturing going on on the door panels and on the dashboard panels as well. We do get a soft armrest right there, that little insert right there on the side. Lots of storage down below. The dashboard is quite square and upright. It has some of those same geometric shapes that we see over there on the door panel. Also sort of a copper colored midsection right there around the air vent. And then lots of different texturing going on on the dashboard as well. Again, that really helps dress things up. Depending on the model that you get, the dashboard insert right here could look sort of like this mid-level gray, or it could look, I guess, sort of like Formica. And I say that in actually a good way. Again, I think that Ford has done a really good job with the materials and the color and the texture combinations in here. In the middle of the dash, we have a touchscreen infotainment system. This is not running the absolute latest version of Ford's Sync software. This looks like the previous generation, so it's not a smaller version of what we see in the Lightning or in the Mach-E. There's a small storage cubby right over there on the side, some physical controls, two large air vents there, dual zone automatic climate control just below that in this model. And if we take a look just down from there, You'll see the USB inputs for the infotainment system, also the power sliding rear window, 12 volt power outlet, engine start stop button, and then lots of storage right down here. You can put your phone in this little slot over here if you want to. There's just a little bit of a cutout for the cable there. Two pretty decently sized cup holders, the rotary style shifter that we see in a lot of different Fords here with a low mode in the middle, electric parking brake, drive mode button, traction control button, auto brake hold. This is a slot where you can store things like those parking receipts, things like that. Another little storage bin, yet another storage bin, and then a softly padded center armrest to reveal yet another storage bin. Moving back up the dashboard, we have a storage cubby right there behind the infotainment system and a color multifunction LCD right here between two analog gauges. The one on the left is the typical power and charge gauge that we find in many hybrids. We then have a central cluster right here that gives us things like our trip fuel economy, uh, status of the vehicle's active safety systems, etc., and a digital speedometer. We then have an analog speedometer on the other side. The steering wheel is pretty typical Ford. If you've been in any modern Ford lately, this should be familiar. We have the controls for the cruise control system over here on this side. Adaptive cruise control is available. And then infotainment buttons are split one side of the wheel and the other. Track forward and backward over here on the right. Jumping inside the XL trim that I was able to drive for a while, we find a two-tone fabric interior. Again, lots of hard plastics on the inside, but also like we see in the upper level trims, a lot of good attention to detail when it comes to mixing the different materials in here. We have the same sort of geometric patterns going on on the door and dashboard inserts. Over here, the glove compartment is a fairly big bin style glove compartment. I had no problem fitting a large 10 inch tablet computer inside. In the dashboard, we find exactly the same touch screen in the XL trim. But below that, we have single zone automatic climate control. We also have a key rather than push button start. And the instrument cluster and the steering wheel change a little bit in the XL trim. We have infotainment buttons over here on the right side and the controls to that multifunction LCD cluster right there. But you'll notice no buttons for cruise control on this because cruise control is not found on the XL model. Also, the LCD cluster has a smaller LCD right there in the middle. So you notice physical gauges for the power charge, engine temperature, fuel level right there, and then this small LCD right in the middle. At least it is still color. The other thing that we don't have, power mirrors. So no power mirrors on this model. The windows are auto down powered, but not auto up. First, let's take a look at the hybrid, and then I'm gonna jump in the two liter turbo model, and we'll talk about how that model feels out on the road. The hybrid version of the Maverick feels very much like the hybrid Escape because it has the same drivetrain, and oddly enough, it's almost the same curb weight as well, and I find that truly impressive. This Maverick weighs just over 3,600 pounds when equipped with the front wheel drive hybrid system. That's just barely more than 100 pounds more than an Escape hybrid. And as a result, zero to 60 performance is very similar to the Escape hybrid. I would expect this to be about 8.5 seconds once I get this at home and I'm able to do some 60 to zero testing and some zero to 60 testing. Now, speaking of that braking distance, the braking feel in the Maverick is excellent. One thing that I've noted with Ford's hybrid system before is that even though this operates on basically the same principle as Toyota's hybrid systems that we'll find in a Prius or a RAV4 hybrid, etc., the regenerative braking feel in this vehicle is much, much better, specifically when we're talking about transitions between braking modes. So if I'm going downhill, it has a very natural engine braking feel. Obviously, that's the regen braking 
back into the battery. If I press lightly on the accelerator pedal, I get more regen ability. And thanks to the liquid cooled battery pack, this is going to give you a little bit more regen ability than we find in some of the air cooled nickel metal hydride hybrids out there. And then when you're transitioning between moderate braking, which is 99 to 100% regen, and then just aggressive braking, say panic stopping, this feels very sure footed. In a lot of Toyota hybrids, there's a funky delay between regen and friction brakes. We don't see that at all in the Ford hybrids. So regardless of what you're doing with the brake pedal in the hybrid Maverick, the brake pedal feel is going to be pretty similar to the two liter turbo Maverick. I'm pretty sure that the top thing on everybody's mind is fuel economy, so let's tackle that next. Over a day of mixed driving and about 150 miles, about a quarter of that in city driving and the rest of that out here on country highways and down the interstate with a 70 mile an hour speed limit, I managed to average 42 miles per gallon. And I had the air conditioning set to 64 because it's about 85 degrees out here in Nashville and I like it cold in the car. Fuel economy in here is absolutely excellent. And that's all down to the design of this hybrid system. What's really cool about this hybrid system is that the front wheels are directly connected to a big electric motor. And that big electric motor means good EV operation at higher speeds and excellent regeneration braking ability. And because that electric motor is essentially directly connected to the wheels via a reduction gear, there are no weird starts and stops as the vehicle is decelerating like you'd find in the F-150 hybrid or the Hyundai and Kia hybrids that use a stepped automatic transmission. When it comes to handling, I think the Santa Cruz is a little bit more fun than the Maverick. The Maverick seems to have a little bit more body roll, and it's also a little bit narrower than the Santa Cruz. But remember, this is going to be less expensive. Now, if you get the upper end version of the Maverick, then we get a fully independent rear suspension. If you get the front wheel drive versions, whether we're talking about the turbo or the hybrid, then it has a torsion beam rear suspension. And I did notice that when I was able to push this a little bit harder out on a winding backcountry road around here that was less than perfect, the rear end can seem to chatter a little bit over that kind of road surface. And the all wheel drive version is definitely a little bit more composed. In any pickup truck, whether we're talking about a small unibody truck like this or a big one ton truck, most of the weight is up front. That's where the engine is. Of course, that's where the cab is for the most part. And then behind we have a relatively light bed because that's where you're going to put your payload. But that does not mean that this drives like a 9 tenth scale Ford Ranger. Instead, this just feels like a slightly larger and ever so slightly heavier Ford Escape. It really does have the same sort of steering feel, the same sort of road feel, etc. that we find in Ford's compact crossover lineup. And even though the dashboard and the seating position is a little bit more upright and a little bit more truck-like than the Ford Escape, your position on the road is a little bit more Escape than Ford Ranger. We're definitely closer to the ground, the center of gravity is lower, and that definitely makes this more fun to drive. The other thing that's definitely more Escape-like than Ranger-like is the ride quality. Even though this has 1,500 pounds of available payload capacity, the rear springs are not as firm as what we find in the Ranger, so this definitely has a more supple ride. Now, it's going to be a little bit firmer than the Escape, generally speaking, especially in the rear, unless you have extra weight back there, but it's definitely very, very livable. It's a little bit too early to talk about cabin noise because I haven't been driving this on the typical road surfaces that I test on, but I have to say the cabin appears to be pretty quiet. I would suspect that this is going to be quieter than the Tacoma, the Colorado, even something like the new Nissan Frontier. I've now hopped inside the model with the two liter turbo and the main things you're going to notice in order are the extra oomph, the fact that this has a real eight speed automatic transmission, all wheel drive is available, and of course, an independent rear suspension. So this does feel a little bit more sorted when the road starts winding like this and the road surface is a little bit less than perfect. Also, it's gonna be more engaging to drive. We have extra power, we have a lot of torque out of this engine. Zero to 60 is likely going to be about two seconds faster in this model. I suspect this is gonna be somewhere right around 6.5 to 6.6 .6 seconds. Now, compared to something like the Hyundai Santa Cruz, I think I do like the directness of the dual clutch automatic transmission in the Santa Cruz, but there are obviously pros and cons. The important thing to remember about a dual clutch transmission is that it's essentially a robotically shifted manual. So it's going to feel like a manual transmission in slow and go traffic. It's not going to be as smooth as an automatic transmission. And if you're doing a lot of really low speed maneuvers like stop and go traffic or mild off roading, or if you're towing a heavy trailer up a really steep gravel road and you need to go slowly, things like that, dual clutch transmissions are more likely to overheat the clutch units than an automatic transmission that doesn't have that kind of clutch to begin with. Fortunately, I was able to spend some time in a front wheel drive two liter turbo model. It was a base XL trim. And in corners like that, you will definitely notice some torque steer in the front wheel drive model. So I would say if you're gonna get the two liter turbo, I would definitely get all wheel drive. And at least in my mind, that's the entire reason to get the two liter turbo in the first place is the addition of all wheel drive. Because for some reason, at least at the moment, it's not available on the hybrid. 
I'm a little bit surprised that we don't have paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel. That's something that I would love to see in the top end Maverick. Instead, we just have the same low button right there on the rotary shifter that we find in the hybrid model. As far as fuel economy goes, I've been averaging 21 MPG in this model. Theoretically, it's EPA rated for 25. That likely has to do with the amount of fun that the turbocharged model is and the fact that I'm out here in the heat. It's about 86 degrees outside and I have the auto start stop disabled. If this was stopping its engine at stoplights, traffic lights, things like that, it likely would be getting better fuel economy. Economy. But obviously, if fuel economy is what you're interested in, there's the Maverick Hybrid. No Ford truck event would be complete without towing, so of course they've brought out a hybrid model and a turbocharged model with trailers that weigh 2,000 pounds, like the ones on the back of this blue hybrid model, and a trailer that weighs 4,000 pounds behind the 2-liter turbo model with all-wheel drive. With 2,000 pounds on the back of the hybrid, the first thing you're going to notice is that the hybrid system is front-wheel drive only. Transitioning from the gravel driveway that I was just on out here on the paved road, there was definitely a little bit of scrabble because of the 2,000 pounds that I have on the back, but it has absolutely no problem pulling this way. The hybrid system actually has a bit of an advantage compared to a traditional gasoline vehicle with about 191 horsepower under the hood. The first advantage is that the electric motors give you an awful lot of torque, and that really makes starting from a stop feel a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more powerful than the numbers would otherwise indicate. And the second thing is that when you're hill climbing, there doesn't have to be a particular fixed ratio between the engine and the wheels. It can be whatever the drivetrain needs it to be in order to give you the best acceleration, the best hill climbing, the best fuel economy, depending on exactly what you're looking for. Thanks to the design of this hybrid system with the liquid cooled battery pack, you likely have a little bit less to worry about when it comes to system overheating or system temperatures than you might in an air cooled hybrid system like we find in the Toyota RAV4. Although you should note that I easily pulled 2000 pounds up to about 12,000 feet with the RAV4. You can check that towing video on my channel out. I take a deep, deep dive into hybrid towing and a lot of that applies directly to this vehicle. Even though this is obviously going to be getting lower fuel economy than if it didn't have 2000 pounds on the back, the fuel economy is going to be considerably higher than you might think. A lot of what I talk about in that video applies directly to the Maverick because the hybrid system is very, very similar. You'll be getting much better fuel economy in this than the two liter turbo engine when you're towing lighter loads. So if you don't need to tow over 2000 pounds, honestly, the hybrid system is gonna be the way to go. As you might expect in any relatively light tow vehicle, again, this doesn't weigh that much more than a Ford Escape, a trailer can sometimes push the Maverick around, whether we're talking about the 2000 pound trailer on the back of this or the 4000 pound trailer that I was able to tow behind the two liter turbo. But on the other hand, because the wheelbase is longer on the Maverick than the Ford Escape, this is pushed around less than that small crossover would be. So if you're looking at something like a small crossover, like a Ford Escape, and you want to tow 2,000 pounds or 4,000 pounds, you might want to take a look at the Maverick because the towing experience is going to be a little bit better. This may not be quite as quick zero to 60, but the extra wheelbase gives the vehicle a little bit of extra stability. And all Mavericks come standard with trailer sway control. If you're willing to give hybrid towing a chance, you'll be rewarded with excellent fuel economy. I've been able to tow this 2,000 pound load over approximately 15 miles today. Some of that on interstate, some of that on rural highway, and a little bit of city traffic as well. And so far, I've averaged 28 miles per gallon. That is very impressive. And it's worth noting that a very similar load in the two liter turbo model that Ford provided got about 17 to 18 miles per gallon. So you will be significantly more fuel efficient in the hybrid model if you don't need to tow over 2,000 pounds. If you wanna be able to tow up to 4,000 pounds, you have to get the two liter turbo and you have to get all wheel drive and then add the 4,000 pound towing package. There was a little bit of confusion early on with the Maverick ordering process about whether or not you needed all wheel drive to get the 4,000 pound towing ability and the answer is yes, you do. There were some orders initially that were placed with front wheel drive and the 4,000 pound towing package because Ford was going to make that an option that gives you the more aggressive final drive ratio but lacked the all wheel drive system. It appears that those early front wheel drive 4,000 pound towing orders have either been upgraded to all wheel drive or those orders have to be replaced with an order for a model with all wheel drive. Checking that 4,000 pound option box gives you a seven pin wiring harness in addition to the four pin wiring harness in the back. And a feature that I honestly was not expecting, a factory installed trailer brake controller over here on the left side of the steering column. There are a decent number of mid-sized pickup trucks that are a decent amount larger than this, that have tire tow ratings than this, that don't have an integrated trailer brake controller from the factory. If you want to get your hands on the new Ford Maverick, you're going to need at least $21,490. That is the base price of $19,995 plus a $1,495 destination charge and 
a whole heap of luck because most of these have been spoken for at least for the first nine or ten months of production. Apparently, if you were to go to the Ford dealer right now today and place an order for a new Maverick, you might get it sometime in calendar year 2022. But exactly when, nobody is able to tell me because the Maverick has been so popular that Ford has received over 100,000 pre-orders for this vehicle and they don't really know exactly how many they can make in the first year. Now that $21,490 essential base price is going to give you the XL trim, which is surprisingly well equipped and will give you the 37 mile per gallon combined hybrid system. I love the way that Ford has done the interior in this vehicle. It doesn't change a whole lot from the base model on up to the top end trim. And actually that's fine with me because this is one of the best interiors I think for under $25,000. Now in the upper end trims, maybe I'd want a few more soft touch materials, but I love the way that Ford has done the selection of colors and the textures on the inside. They've really dressed up the hard plastic plastics and even the base upholstery way more than I thought they would for a base truck. Now the base truck is going to give you steel wheels, although that may be a selling feature for some folks. 23,775 is going to step you up into the XLT trim. I think that's where a lot of people will end up. And if you want the Lariat hybrid like this, this is going to start at 26,985. Those prices, of course, include that destination charge. If you want the first edition, they're likely all spoken for, but maybe you'd be able to find one for an astronomical dealer markup. Theoretically, it would start at 32,360. If you want the two liter turbo, you can get that on any of the trims. It's gonna add $1,085 to the price tag for the front wheel drive model. All wheel drive is an extra $2,220 and the 4,000 pound towing package available on that model requires all wheel drive. That's gonna add $745. Just over $2,200 may sound like a lot for all-wheel drive, but this is still going to be one of the least expensive all-wheel drive vehicles available in North America. And one of the reasons that the all-wheel drive system is a little bit more expensive than a select few competitors is because of the changes to the rear suspension. We get a torsen beam rear suspension if you get the front-wheel drive model. We get a fully independent rear suspension if you choose all-wheel drive. Another thing that surprised me with the pricing lineup on the Maverick is that you can get the all-wheel drive system, the towing package, and the 2-liter turbo on even the XL grade of the pickup truck. So if you're interested in getting that 4,000 pounds of payload ability and you don't want to break the bank, that could be yours for about $25,000, including the destination charge. Obviously, when it comes to competition, it's a two-way race between this and the Hyundai Santa Cruz. I think the Santa Cruz is a little bit sportier in terms of its general feel, especially if you get the optional turbocharged engine and the eight-speed dual-clutch transmission. That is a ton of fun to drive. This with the two-liter turbo is definitely faster, but it's not that same level of fun that we find in the Santa Cruz. But the Santa Cruz will cost you more, and it's never going to be as efficient as the Maverick. Some of the interior materials feel more premium, so if you're looking to spend, say, $30,000 on your next truck, I would probably take a look at the Santa Cruz because its interior I do think is more premium and I love that dual clutch transmission with the turbocharged engine but if you're looking to spend under $30,000 Quite simply, at this moment, I would buy the Maverick. And to tell you the truth, I was really, really tempted to pre-order a Maverick as well, because I have to replace my Hyundai Nexo at some point in May of 2022, and I thought this would be an absolutely perfect replacement for that vehicle. However, I ended up deciding not to do that because, honestly, there are too many good vehicles out there, and I really want to get something that doesn't have a Ford logo on it, because I do have an F-150 Lightning on order for our next long-term car here at Alex and Autos. And I figured that a Mach-E followed by a Lightning followed by Maverick might just be a little too Ford heavy and people might think that these videos were sponsored by Ford. They're absolutely not. I honestly think that the Maverick, the Lightning, and the Mach-E are just some of the most interesting vehicles that are going to be on sale in 2021 and 2022. To be perfectly honest, even if you've never considered a pickup truck in your life before, you should put the Maverick on your shopping list. If you're shopping for a Corolla or a Civic or an Elantra or a RAV4 or a CRV or a Ford Escape, you should just take a look at the Maverick. It is going to be a little bit more difficult to park because this is several feet longer than some of those compact sedans or compact hatchbacks, but it's an awful lot more practical. And oddly enough, you don't really give up much of anything at all. Almost 200 horsepower out of the hybrid system makes this perform better than the average compact sedan. And you're gonna get 37 miles per gallon combined. Over my day of mixed driving in this vehicle, I got over 40 MPG. The fuel economy is absolutely incredible, as long as you don't get that two liter turbo. And to be honest, I would skip the two liter turbo unless you really needed all wheel drive or the 4,000 pounds of towing ability. I would simply get the hybrid system. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you get if you're looking to spend say $25,000 or $30,000? Let me know both those answers down there in the comment section below. Would you look at this or would you look at a lower configuration of something like the Santa Cruz? It's gonna give you a little bit more bed capability, a little bit more style and a little bit better handling, I think, but way worse fuel economy than the model that I'm driving here. Let me know and I'll see all of you next week.